Yeah, we're going to talk about polka dots. Um, uh, so my name is Fabian. Uh, with me is Rob up there. He's going to speak in a bit. Um, yeah, we're both with Parity Technologies. Um, and uh, how we're going to do it is uh, um, I'm going to give a bit of kind of um, intentions. Um, so why are we bothering, you know, putting all this effort into building polka dot? Why does it make sense? Um, then uh, segue into kind of the capabilities you get um, from a protocol like Polkadot and give kind of like a very rough high level overview of the architecture. Um, and then Rob will take over Rob's, um, we're one of the lead uh, developers on Polkadot and uh, actually just a couple of weeks ago or days ago got rewarded a Teal Fellowship for his work there, so uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, so status quo, um, uh, yeah, I just want to kind of like talk a bit about what, what are actually the problems we're seeing right now and kind of like how, how does the, the ecosystem um, look right now. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we've seen over the course of the last uh, couple of years really, um, yeah, just an explosion in the number of um, not just blockchains deployed, but actually like different blockchain technologies. Um, and, uh, you know, although we have these like general purpose uh, blockchains like Ethereum, right, not everyone is building on Ethereum. Um, and that's because like if you have different use cases, different projects, um, then you actually need different designs. It's especially true on um, like for, for state machine designs. Um, so next slide please. Um, and you can see that very nicely actually in the enterprise space where like most of the enterprise um, development today is not happening in the public space, right? It's happening on, on these like isolated private permission chains because, um, well actually the, the privacy and permissioning uh, requirements of most um, you know, enterprise use cases are just not met. Um, you also see it, uh, if we have the next slide, um, it kind of like, the equivalent in the, in the public space is a bit um, that, you know, if teams, um, if if you don't, if you um, if you want to build something and uh, you know existing blockchains don't fulfill your requirements, you start a new project and um, you see a lot of like tribalism or like often called maximalism in the space, right? Where uh, you know someone claims uh, you know it's an uh, Ethereum killer or whatever killer and like they solve all the problems and uh, you know this is going to be uh, the final solution to all the problems we have. And in reality, it's just another snapshot of like like you know, technology we have right now, right? Um, and, um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, what we end up with is this crazily fragmented landscape, right? Like tons of different blockchains in the public space, in the private space. Um, current blockchain technologies cannot, like, communicate with each other, at least not in a trustless or decentralized manner. Um, and, um, yeah, we kind of end up um, in, like, similar data silos of, like, blockchain, you know, promise us to, to break out of um, in the first place. <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, long story short, like this is kind of the reason why uh, why we, you know, wanted to, uh, like, came up with Polkadot and then are, are trying to build that. Um, yeah, so I already mentioned it, um, like current blockchain technologies cannot, not really talk to each other in the way we would like to have it. Um, so really this all falls under kind of like the umbrella interoperability, right? You want to make sure that blockchain, uh, like separate blockchains um, can talk to each other and understand each other. Um, and um, there are different approaches to that, but like for us, kind of like these three things, and probably also the next slide, sum up like pretty well. Uh, yeah, stay on this one, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you heard your password. Um, and yeah, kind of like some of our approach to that. So one thing is we really want to make sure you can connect uh, chains that are um, that are different state machines as well as different consensus, right? This should not be a factor whether you can connect chains or not. Uh, second thing is you want to support past, present, future. So what do I mean by that? Like if I say past, I mean um, like networks and technologies that are already out there, right? You already have the public Ethereum network, you already have Bitcoin, you already have Ccash, so you want to be able to like integrate all that into your, your interoperability network. Um, you want to be able to support everything present, so like kind of like state-of-the-art technology, stuff that you can build right now. Um, and future is you don't want to assume too much about 
how systems in the future look, right? Like, people will come up with stuff we can't even imagine yet, but you will still be able, you still want to be able um, to integrate those. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the third point there was, uh, you know, you want to have public and private be able to run in the, in the same network. Um, so, uh, you know, for, for private chains, uh, you can think a bit about it, like, uh, something like firewalls, right? You want to, like, if you have a private chain, you want to be able uh, to control, um, like, how much information about your data you give away, how much people can actually interact with your network, but at the same time, you don't want to be completely isolated, right? It should be up to you. You still want to be in your safe haven without being isolated. <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the next thing is uh, you want to think beyond tokens. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious, and, and uh, you know, you can very easily reason about why it makes sense to have interoperability with tokens. Um, you know, you should just think about like decentralized exchange or something like that. A lot of people are actually working on that with like, atomic swaps and stuff like that. So you want to be able to, um, you know. Uh, basically exchange value uh, uh, across chains, right? Um, the reality is a lot of um, kind of messages are not necessarily value transfers, right? So you want to be able to like really have arbitrary message passing, which is a super set of just value transfers. And with Polkadot, we just want to support like both, right? <clears throat> so next slide. Um, so another thing is uh, co-securing, or like how we call it often, pull security, um, which is uh, kind of the idea that like whenever you spin up a new chain, um, you compete with other chains um, over the security resources, right? Like if you think about proof of work, the moment you start another, another proof of work chain, um, you kind of like compete over like there's just so much hashing power in the world, and you compete over that, right? And if you look at um, it's actually just published like a few weeks ago. Uh, a website that kind of like lists, looks a bit like coin market cap, but it lists um, how much it will cost to 51% attack um, certain proof of, uh, like 51% attack certain proof of work chains for one hour. And if you look at like top five, top ten, they're pretty secure. You could maybe even argue some of them are like overly secure, right? Uh, mine was still mine on it because, you know, the incentives are designed in a way that it's still worth it to do it. Um, but it's very unreasonable that someone will attack that. And then the moment you drop out of the top five, top ten, it actually becomes very, very cheap to attack these networks. Um, and you know, the, the same reasoning is true for, like a similar reasoning is true for proof of stake, where you, should, you only have so much value in the world that people are willing to put down to to become validators. Right? So if we have the next slide up, if you'll, uh, yeah, exactly. You'll see this kind of like illustrated um, here with Litecoin and Zcash. It's actually a pretty good example of Zcash. So when Zcash started, um, really what they wanted to be innovative in is kind of like pr a privacy-preserving coin, right? Um, they were really innovative on the zero knowledge part of things, um, like a very kind of like a unique thing in their state machine. Um, but what they suddenly had to think of is, um, uh, well, how do we uh, get a community of miners that will, um, you know, secure our chain? And even if we have that at the beginning, like every if we have the same proof of work algorithm that uh, Bitcoin has, like even the the, the smallest uh, Bitcoin mining pool would can just completely take over our chain, right? So they have to think a lot about how can they tweak their their consensus uh, to to not make it happen. Um, so um, the pool security. Uh, um, this full security approach, really what you have is like every chain in this network uh, shares the same security um, um, uh, guarantees. And so by that, no chain is like overly randomly secure. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Another thing that Polkadot um, provides is um, yeah, what's often referred to as like horizontal scaling. Um, right, so it's the idea of you can run multiple chains in parallel and by that kind of like parallelize uh, um, execution or like transactions, um, <clears throat> which is uh, yeah, a pretty, pretty important feature. Like you can think a bit about it, like yes, you can connect chains that, have, that look very differently, but you can of course also connect chains that look exactly the same, right? And if you're able to like parallelize transactions over that, you actually um, also get scalability. Um, so next slide, please. Another thing, and this this really would be a, a whole kind of meetup or talk in itself, uh, but I just want to mention it here. Um, it's something that, that you will often hear if you if you read about Polkadot um, or hear us talk about it. It's called Parity Substrate, and it's um, it's basically a technology stack or framework uh, to build blockchain from scratch. Right? 
Um, and we actually use this stack, so if, um, I just, by the way, all open source, like, like everything we're talking about. Um, so we are using that, you can also use it if you want to build your chain. Uh, but we use that to build uh, Polkadot, um, at least kind of like the relay chain, and I'll talk a bit um, in a bit about what that what it actually is. Um, but um, yeah, we also use this, like you can imagine, if you want to have this network where you have well, lots of different chains that look very differently, you want to have some sort of on ramp for that, right? You don't want everyone to like think about like networking from scratch and consensus from scratch and all the stuff. Like it's basically a framework that gives you a bunch of stuff like out of the box and uh, like of libraries uh, to really you know, make it much easier to build kind of like a new, uh, unique blockchain. Okay, next slide. Um, so now I talk a lot about you know what you will get. Uh, so how do we actually get there? Um, like this is kind of like the most high level overview you uh, could possibly give. Um, so we have in the middle a relay chain, which really is a blockchain in itself, um, but. Is, uh, it does nothing more than like provide this kind of like pull security feature. Like it it uh, secures the network um, and uh, it gives you, it makes sure that messages between what we call parachains um, get relayed so these parachains can communicate with each other. And parachains comes from parallelized chains, is like the blockchains that like hang off this relay chain. Right? So you'll see it here, they'll have different shapes which kind of like indicates you know, uh, that they like look very differently. Uh, really, they don't necessarily, like, we don't, we assume very little about those chains, like it doesn't necessarily have to be a blockchain, right? Um, could also be some form of other decentralized uh, system. And um, <clears throat> parachains, there's a lot of actual logic sits, uh, right? And uh, um, where, the, where the transactions get processed. And then bridges, and this leads back into um, what I was saying, you want to be able to um, uh, support the past. Right. You want to be able to support chains that already exist. So it's very unlikely that the Ethereum community tomorrow says, okay, let's all become a parachain and fuck it up. Right? They all already have their own consensus and they are very secure. Right? So what you can do is build uh, what, yeah, what we call bridges. Um, it's basically a piece of technology that lets you uh, link a chain into the fuck network, network um, and lets it keep their own security guarantees, their own consensus, but it get, gets it in trouble with it as part of it. Um, all right, I think with that, I'll hand over to Rob. framework, 
where you can basically plug in any kind of computation that's possible. Um, we want it to be scalable so that it can scale to do lots and lots of work over uh, over time. So initially it will be just sort of a quadratic scaling over the blockchains that exist right now. Um, and uh, as well a, uh, an ultra efficient root layer because uh, if you think about it, scalability sort of flows from the root if you have some kind of smart contract platform, uh, but it's inefficient. Even if you build like fast layer two solutions on that, they're still going to be bottlenecked by that root level. Uh, so making sure that the root level is very fast as well is important. Uh, but we're also going to do some research into things like hierarchical scalability. So that's, uh, for example, a relay chain where one of the parachains attached to it is another relay chain, or so on. And you end up with a sort of tree of chains uh, where transactions between them would propagate all the way up to the root and back down to some other leaf. And with this approach, uh, you could, with considerable latency, actually achieve very, very high scalability. And that's sort of our next avenue for scalability research. Um, and of course, it has to be secure. So we want to very rigorously define uh, the model in which we're working, especially adversarial model, uh, how messages between nodes can get delayed, whether they can get dropped, how long it can take, um, how many nodes in the system can be compromised, what proportion of money the adversary, the, the adversary uh, can have. And under these constraints, we would design the system to be secure. Uh, and those were our design principles. Uh, so to explain parachains a little bit more in depth, as I mentioned, it's a piece of WebAssembly code that gets registered on the relay chain. So this relay chain is really just managing sort of a registry of parachains uh, validity functions. So a validity function would just be something that takes like a block, for example, and a piece of data that proves the block's validity, and then executes and says, this block is good, or it says, this block is bad. Um, and that's just the core building block of the parachain. So if you want to write a parachain, basically you have to write this validity function. And you would do that in a high level language like uh, C++ or Rust. It would be not something too high level because it has to be very performant, uh, but something that can compile down to WebAssembly uh, and then you could register it on the relay chain. Um, the other part that you would need is a collator node. So what a collator node does is a special node that actually creates those blocks that sort of get pushed into this validity function to check whether they're good. Uh, and the last thing of parachains is uh, the message queues between them. So the way I would put it is that the relay chain manages the finalization or co-finalization of all these parachains and it plugs all this into the pooled security or shared security that Fabian talked about a bit. Uh, but the other thing it agrees on is the sort of secret or hidden state of message queues between them. And to make sure that those messages don't get lost or dropped, and then you get actually trustless messaging and interoperability between these chains. Um, and these three parts are really just what make up a parachain. Most of that is uh, abstracted away for you from libraries for development. Um, but as a parachain developer, you would have to put some of these pieces together yourself. Um, yeah, so now I will talk a bit about the different economic roles that we have. So first and foremost, uh, the ones which are really the most important are the validators. So what the validators do is they manage relay chain block authorship. So they're the ones who actually grow the relay chain. They actually include parachain uh, candidates, can, uh, parachain blocks, and decide what's good. They basically put their own money on the line in a proof of stake system saying, yes, I think that's good, or no, I think that's bad, and uh, they grow the chain. And they also steward availability of external data. So uh, as I said, with a parachain validity function, you have a block, but you also have some piece of data that proves it. And this might actually be really big, because if you imagine a uh, block that contains a financial tra transaction that covers one million accounts, you can't just put the record of all those a million accounts on the chain to prove that this block is good. So rather you put some kind of cryptographic reference to this record of those one million accounts and then keep the data that actually stores those one million accounts off-chain. And the validators are also responsible for making sure that the availability of that external data necessary to validate the parachain blocks stays there, that it's always there, and that people can actually reproduce the results of evaluating parachain blocks. Um, back one. No. No, not back one. This is the one. Um, so the next thing is the nominators. So essentially in a consensus protocol you have this issue that 
as the number of validators or participants grows, the amount of work that they have to do grows with the square of that number. But then we have this other trade-off that with a proof-of-stake system, we want to maximize the amount of money that is in the staking system as opposed to liquid, because then that would say that you know, it provides higher security for the network. So the nomination mechanism is how we break out of that. So we essentially keep the amount of validators who actually do the work of agreement fairly low, but then we allow nominators to stake on their behalf and say, this guy is good, I trust him to do a good job, and if this guy gets rewarded, the nominator would get a corresponding reward, and if he gets punished, he would get a corresponding punishment. Uh, and yeah, it provides an econo additional economic security without additional consensus overhead. Uh, and it's done with a heuristic-based assignment, where essentially a nominator can say, like, oh yeah, of these guys, um, assign me to the one that works the best with the other pool of nominators. Then we have a, a fairly complicated off-chain heuristic that assigns people to uh, the specific validators that they would like out of that. Um, and then we also have the collators. So what collators do is they create those parachain candidates, they give them to validators. validators run them through the consensus process, they decide if they're good or not. Um, and what a collator does is it works on only a single parachain, because uh, working on a single parachain is already a heavy enough job that a collator couldn't really do it on more than one parachain. And the other thing that they do is because they're always running a full node on this parachain is to monitor it for misbehavior. So if they see, oh, these validators included a block for my parachain, but this parachain block is bad, then they would issue some kind of on-chain report and uh, cause a dispute, provide economic security. Um, and the last thing is these fishermen. So fishermen basically do that last bit that I was talking about, but also without being collators. And these roles are fairly nebulous, right? Like, it's not as though you have to go into some registry to actually become one of these roles. It's more like you just spin up a node and say, I want to be a collator, and I want to be a fisherman, or whatever. Um, so in that sense, it'll be completely open and uh, permissionless. And yes, they can trigger the availability and validity game, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but first, we're going to look at this very simple diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, so that basically sums up what I was talking about before. So we have this relay chain at the heart. Uh, there are different validators in the center, so those are little colored triangles. And they have different colors to sort of indicate that you know sometimes they're assigned to one chain and sometimes they're assigned to another but they fundamentally perform the same action and periodically like, their color might change. So um, one of those green guys is right now assigned to the green parachain, whereas in a few blocks from now, he might be assigned to the red parachain. Um, and then we have these different parachains, which are different shapes attached to the system. Uh, so off to the right is notable because it's this hierarchical thing that I was talking about before, where you have another relay chain attached to that root level relay chain. And at the bottom is a bridge. But really, from the perspective of the validators, or the perspective of the collators, or the fishermen, it's actually the same job to do. Um, so to ensure validity, we have a few things to keep in mind. So one is that uh, for scalability, we don't want all validators to check all work to be done, because then you're bounded by the processing power of a single computer. So rather, we step into a realm of economic security. So we have some amounts of validators, and they're randomly sampled to be put onto different parachains. So not all validators are looking at every parachain. So it's possible that if we have some contingent of validators overall who are bad, that you can get a random sample sometimes, which is completely or majority bad. So in our security model, bad validators might periodically be selected and then include bad things. So fishermen issue this on-chain dispute if they witness this, and then that has to be resolved by all validators, and then this bad block would be reverted. But the interesting thing here is the equilibrium that gets formed by this game. Because there's this defense against bad stuff, the bad stuff would never happen because there's no incentive for purely rational actors who are self-interested to take these actions and include something. Um, and we do roughly the same thing for the parachain availability. The thing is that there is a deeper problem with availability. So with validity, you can easily, you get basically a binary true or false. Is the thing good or is the thing bad? Uh, with availability, you can say this data isn't available, 
And even if the person was withholding the data and refusing to provide it to the network, they can then come back and say, no, it was available, you just didn't see it. So it's impossible to discern between data not being available and someone refusing to see data. So we have to take on a more reputational-based game, but it's roughly the same principle. So if a fisherman would see this data is not available, he would go around and sort of surreptitiously collect statements from various values. And if you have a sample that says, um, and you would take a large enough sample that it would be statistically significant that says this data is not available, then we would sort of proceed further into that game and uh, see how we can punish those who are withholding the data. Uh, in worst case, the data never existed, and then you also have to do a reversion. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about the consensus algorithm, like the underlying agreements on blocks. So um, this is a bit separate from the actual parachain agreement that happens as part of this, but just to speak specifically about chain growth of the relay chain. How do you go from block n to block n plus 1? Uh, so our goals were, specifically, it should be cheap to become a validator, and that's relatively cheap. I'm not saying you can throw five bucks on the table and all of a sudden you have this responsibility. Uh, but maybe that you can put a few hundred or a few thousand down, uh, and that's a barrier of entry that your average sysadmin could meet. Um, we also wanted to separate block production from finality. So finality is that property that if a block were to be reverted, that it would be associated with some cost. Um, and we felt that block production and finality are not actually particularly linked. Because you can finalize some block, and then that sort of inherently finalizes all its ancestors. So if you come to a full agreement on every block, that's sort of wasted labor. Uh, so you can sort of prospectively create new blocks that may get reverted, and then run a finality gadget behind the head of the chain. Um, and we want this finality gadget to make use of that blockchain structure. So the block production system is going to be a round-based, probabilistically safe system. So that's like every four seconds, for example, a new guy gets chosen, he gets to make a block, and assuming that certain network conditions hold, um, it will be probabilistically safe, like 99.9% .9 safe or something. Um, and that's sort of like the guarantee that Bitcoin might give you. Um, and you, we do this with a large pool of validators with randomly chosen samples. And authors are aware shortly before they turn so that they can sort of step up, make the connections that they need to to other peers on the network, and then as soon as it's their turn, make that block and broadcast it out. Um, and that's sort of what it looks like. So we have each block, a different author, randomly selected from that author. Uh, the next thing is this finality gadget. And this is actually the really interesting part, uh, because the block authorship, to be honest, is actually kind of basic. Um, but the finality gadget is that we have all the validators voting on like which block they think is first of all good and also the highest in the chain. Uh, and that gets transitively applied to all the ancestors. So if I vote on block 10, it, gets, it also counts as a block on vote 9 or 8 all the way back to the very first block. Uh, and this is done with a small and focused and highly staked pool of validators. And we have this accountable safety metric, which is that if something is reverted, then we slash one third of all the state from this pool. And that's theoretically the highest you can go in this network setting. So we can say, yeah, we think that messages would arrive within 30 seconds, but that's a little bit nebulous. So we would say, with our network condition, we can always slash one third even if messages arrive 100 years from now. Um, so that's sort of what this would look like. So we have seven validators in this pool on the right. So to get two thirds plus one, signatures, or it's actually uh, not quite two-thirds plus one, but two F plus one, where F is the smallest number, or the greatest number less than one-third. Um, anyway, let's call it five. Uh, we need five votes all in all, but on either side of this fork, we don't have five votes, but we can still finalize the common ancestor because of that. And that means that we can get finality quite quickly, even when uh, validators views of the network diverge. Um, so, where are we now? We released the proof of concept one, which had uh, on chain governance, which can perform forkless upgrades of the network. So, actually, our goal is to take this running proof of concept ne uh, one network and actually, without hard fork, to upgrade it to proof of concept two, when none of this code had actually been written for proof of concept two at the time of the launch of the PRC one network. Uh, the other thing that PRC one had was 
um, basic proof of stake, a basic UI. So it was really just, let's get this network, let's get this governance, let's get this forkless upgrade stuff out there, and then we can just keep rolling and adding to it without having to redeploy it. Um, so what POC2 has is uh, basically co-finalization of parachains, the first parachains implementation. What it's missing is message passing between them, uh, and that will come, well, also POC2 has a light client. Uh, some of you like light clients a lot, so we would be happy. Uh, a light client is a node that doesn't verify all the blocks and checks block headers. And that's really good if you have just a laptop that doesn't have a ton of power. Um, so with POC3, that's coming up next, um, after POC2, it goes in order. Um, <laughs> POC3 is going to have this implementation of the hybrid consensus that I just talked about. Um, and then POC4 is going to have the implementation of this validity slash availability. And I would say then we're basically about 80% feature complete with what Polkadot is meant to offer. And beyond that, it's a little too far to say exactly what we plan to include in the next POCs. We want to have 10 of them running up to the mainnet launch in Q3 2019. Uh, and it'll mostly be incremental improvements, modeling, testing, auditing, that sort of thing. Uh, just to make sure that it's really airtight, even though uh, from POC4 you'll really have about almost all the functionality that you would want as a developer on Polkadot. Um, and in parallel, we would be building developer tools, so things like uh, libraries and roster and other languages for writing parachain runtimes or validity functions or call later nodes and things like that, just to make it simple. Um, if you are one of these people, or no one of these people, they're everywhere. Um, let us know. We're always looking for researchers, parachain implementers, educators, community leaders to work on Polkadot, help contribute to it, help us figure out some of the hardest problems in the space, um, and just get the word out there. Uh, so please talk to us if you feel like you fit one of those roles. Um, thank you very much.